Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, the unscripted show that celebrates unsung heroes, myth busts historical lies, and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed our world. I'm your host, Scott Rank. Hey everyone, welcome back to our series on the last night of the Titanic. We're looking at the lives of the people who were there on that fateful night. Joined as always with our resident Titanic expert who's going to help us look at the lives of the trendsetters and that is Veronica Hinky. Veronica, how are you? I'm well. I'm really looking forward to talking with you today about the trendsetters aboard the Titanic. You know, there were many trendsetters. It was the leading ship of its day and um, we've looked at all the different people and uh, sort of narrowed down to three very key trendsetters that we want to make sure we capture in the podcast series. And the people who went down aren't people I would have associated with the Titanic, but this is probably one of the reasons it was so memorable so quickly. It's sort of like there's a disaster that happens at the Met Gala. If we think of the trendsetters who go down with the ship, Uh, Some of them very wealthy, some of them who are really setting trends at this time in the early 20th century. And there's a term that you use to describe two of these figures, and that was the fashion plates. And I had no familiarity with this term. So before we jump into the background of some of these figures, could you tell me what did that mean, the fashion plates? Well, you know, fashion plates is an old expression from when I was growing up. People would describe someone as a fashion plate if they were someone who really put a lot of effort into uh, wearing the latest styles and um, looking their best and and looking fantastic. And uh, the two uh, people that we're going to talk about today who were definitely two of the tops in fashion plates that were aboard the Titanic, they were both, ironically, Scott, named Lucille. There was a uh, lady, Lucy Duff Gordon, and also Lucille Polk Carter, and she was a descendant of President Polk. Right, and then the other one is one of the wealthiest people on Earth at the time, and he was also a trendsetter in his own way. So let's jump right in. Let's talk about a presidential descendant, a partial to presidents. Tell me about Lucille Polk Carter. Well, Lucille Polk Carter survived the Titanic with her husband and their two children. However, like so many people, even though they survived physically, there were still so many scars from that horrible night that they weren't able to proceed with their life the way that they had been in the past, the way they had lived in the past. And in this case, um, people were you know, spreading the rumor around that um, Lucille filed for divorce from her husband, William Ernest Carter, because she felt that they had been abandoned by him on that last night in the Titanic, that he had sort of fended for himself and, and left them to fend for themselves. Um, Lucille was just an incredible fashion plate or a, an icon of fashion. She was in all the headlines around 1912 when the Titanic sailed. One story reported that she created excitement in Philadelphia and New York. Uh, she lived in Philadelphia with her daring costumes and reckless foreign hand driving. Uh, the newspaper story went on to say that not many months ago, she had startled Philadelphia by appearing in the lobby of one of the nicest hotels. You know, there are so many old historic hotels that were there back in the 1912 and 11 years. And she was known to um, be in those hotels for different social gatherings. And this newspaper article said that she was wearing about the tightest silk costume that had been seen in the Quaker City since the hobble skirt became popular. And I thought that was interesting that the story noted a hobble skirt. So I delved into that to find out what was the hobble skirt. And, you know, Scott, this is actually something that Mackenzie Dawson covered a few years ago in the New York Post about um, fashion trends and history that were actually somewhat dangerous. The hobble skirt was one of those. It was a tight fitting skirt around the ankles and it was one of the shortest fads ever. It was popular from about 1908 to 1912. It was 
um, an, an incredible Edwardian fashion trend. And um, there were stories, like I mentioned, of people who uh, were, you know, actually killed because of their attire. An 18-year-old girl drowned when she fell over the railing of an Erie Canal bridge uh, two years before the Titanic sailed. And a woman was killed at a Paris racetrack because her hobble skirt prohibited her from getting um, out of the way of a horse. Uh, New York Street railways even began to introduce cars with no step up to try to accommodate these fashionable ladies of Manhattan and other cities. And, of course, Lucille was one of those. That sounds like it wouldn't be any more efficient to walk than it would to hop in that thing. It, I imagine being in a right. beanbag race of hopping up and down. Because ankle mobility, I mean, being able to actually move your legs is how humanity has been walking for a few million years. So, yeah, it sounds pretty impractical to me. Yeah, and uh, the Carters were also known to be setting trends and, of course, aboard the Titanic, they set these trends as well. They were um, setting trends in the dogs they had with them. They had some fashionable dogs with them at the time, the King's Charles Cavalier Spaniels. And also a car, the Renault automobile that they carried with them back from Europe to Philadelphia. Or it, of course, did not make it back to Philadelphia, but they were transporting it. Um, the Renault car that they had in cargo was the car that inspired that steamy window scene that we see in James Cameron's movie, Titanic. Yes, definitely iconic. If you haven't seen the movie, if you have, you know exactly what we're talking about. So yeah. this Lucille, this first Lucille, what happens to her on the Titanic? What is her experience when the ship is going down? You know, one of the neatest things that I re remember about her story is that she took the time to stick a diamond horseshoe into her bathrobe when she went to the boat deck. And I thought that was really neat. It just shows someone who, even in a time of fear and, and you know, when you're afraid of the unknown, you are thinking in terms of, you know, something like that, a, a something to help you stay focused on uh, making it through what whatever's in front of you. Um, she, she said that, um, to the Baltimore Sun, she told them that they had had a pleasant voyage from England. The ship behaved splendidly, and they didn't anticipate any trouble at all. But at about 10.45, she went to bed. She said most of the men were in the smoking lounge. Her husband was one of those. And then she was awakened by a sudden crash. So that would have been a little bit less than an hour later after she went to bed because the Titanic hit the iceberg at 11.40 p.m., so um, she looked at the clock. She said it was about 14 minutes before midnight. And um, the first she knew of the accident was this tremendous thump that had thrown her out of her uh, spot where she was lying down or her bed or her bunk. Um, and then her husband came down to the stateroom and told her he had heard in the smoking room they had hit an iceberg. I'm not sure if he had actually heard that in the smoking room, but with Wherever he was with his cronies at that point, you know, he heard about the iceberg. So um, they later said that they had been called to the deck, but with no greater excitement than when they were being called to dinner. It was very low key at that point. Um, she got there and saw men helping women into lifeboats. She herself got into lifeboat four. And I was pretty inspired to read that she took an oar. She started oaring the lifeboat after it was launched. And then she said something that was incredibly interesting. She said that at about 10 minutes after 1 a.m. that morning, that April 15th morning, um, there was a terrific explosion. She said the giant hulk of the Titanic blew up, rearing in the water, she said, like a spurred horse and then sinking beneath the waves. Could you imagine seeing that? In the process of her surviving the Titanic, her and all of her children survived. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And that was due to the benefit of women and children first? Or was there something else you think her ability to be able to effectively get off? Right. I think she did really well for herself. And I, I kind of, you know, I have this picture in my mind of this woman, you know, going for the gold, the diamond horseshoe and just helping her stay strong however she needed to, even though, as, as people later purportedly said, she had felt somewhat abandoned that night by her husband. And, you know, we don't know for sure that that's what she said. 
but um, there there was a quite a rumor mill that was churning. She also said that when she looked up from the from the lifeboat, one of the last things she saw were the men who were left on deck, and they were praying. And as they prayed, the band was in the saloon playing hymns. Yeah, we'll definitely get to the band later because that's a very important factor of this. It's interesting that her husband survived as well. Do you know anything about that of when it seems like a lot of men in his position wouldn't have why William did survive? Right. And it's interesting, too, that he survived in the same lifeboat with um, the president of the White Star Line, Mr. Bruce Ismay. Um, They were the only two first class passengers in that lifeboat. Do you know anything about why? Is it they just happen to be at the right place at the right time? That would be my best guess. I know that um, two years later, you know, the the Carters did file for divorce and the um, story was said to be because of how things went down that that night. And, um, you know, it was not the not the best ideal for them as a family. Yeah, in the midst of that, so much emotion can be attached to it. There's feelings that they were abandoned from Lucille's side that William had done that. So there's a lot of dust up that can happen after the fact. Well, I'd like to take a look at the second one of our Lucille's. Makes it easy to group them in this episode. So tell me about Lucy Christiana. What made her another fashionista or fashion play, as it were? And what was her experience? Well, this is another really inspiring woman of the Edwardian years, Scott. I'm so uh, just amazed by her. Uh, She was a single mother and she needed to start a new business of her own to make ends meet. And she ended up being one of the top fashion designers, one of the top business owners of her day. Um, when we watch shows like Downton Abbey, when we watch James Cameron's Titanic, almost every woman's outfit that you're seeing was inspired by Lady Duff Gordon's designs. She had the um, those you know curvy high heeled shoes with the clunky heels, the shimmering dresses with pearls and embroidery, those ubiquitous hats with endless broad rims. Those were the signature fashion styles of Edwardian times, and those were mostly designed. That She was one of the key designers of the time, and so many of her designs trickled down into the more um, everyday wear, ready-to-wear fashions. But um, she was incredible. She had her own column about fashion, just a word from Paris. And in it, she would announce to the world from her travels the most up-to-date fashions. She would talk about some of her most recent designs. Like on New Year's Eve 1911, just a few months before the Titanic, she released one of her latest dresses called Dawn of the Desert, which had a very Egyptian flair to it. Um, Very much like the style of the day with high empire-style waists just below the bus. Um, Dresses hung very loosely they almost had like a Art Nouveau look to them with um, Art Nouveau style headbands and um, you know a very soft, almost tousled look in the hair and the dress. It was very much like the um, pictures, you know, the drawings of of old, of um, you know, I guess I would describe them as um, the Egyptian looking. Um, the Egyptian statues that we see, the, what, the way they're dressed and sort of, you know, the, the drapery look. Um, and so she was just a very self-made woman. She lived behind Herod's in a uh, beautiful townhouse and had several different shops around the world at the time they sailed on the Titanic. She was not hurting for money at all. Um, she was friends with some of the leading designers of the day, including not just fashion for clothing, but also for the home. Like uh, one of her her dearest friends was Elsie DeWolf, who was a popular actress and also an interior decorator at the time. And she designed things for the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, um, Henry Frick, who of course was the um, chairman of Carnegie Steel. So um, these were the people who were Um, designing things and leading the style for the most opulent women and men of the time. Probably reasonable to assume that most of the women on first class would have been wearing her fashion. Yes, definitely would have been wearing her fashion. and It was seen all over the Titanic, but nowhere as prolifically as in first class. 
was she remarried at this point because her title is Lady Duff Gordon, which is different from her maiden name? Is that how she got the lady title? That's right. Yes, she married Sir Cosmo Duff Gordon, and the two of them were traveling together. Yeah, so tell me about when the ship goes down. And she has her own experiences, and there's also rumors about 